Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We'll start in a minute. Uh, so just allowing uh, you all uh, you all to enter slowly. Um, and in the meantime, I'll use this time to, to share my slides. So I'll share the whole screen. I hope you can see it properly. Okay, yes. Great. So it's uh, 2.30. Uh, people are still joining, but let's start. In any case, this event is recorded. So if you miss anything, you will find everything on our uh, website soon after the event. Uh, welcome again. My name is Maria Giuffrida from Trust IT. I am managing the communication and dissemination of Alloxi, uh, who is uh, the organizer of this event in cooperation with the other seven projects that you'll see uh, during the event. Uh, we have a very uh, rich uh, agenda uh, this afternoon, so I'm just going to give you a very, very uh, quick welcome, showing you the topics we will discuss. Basically, we will start with an introduction on uh, uh, IoT in agriculture policies delivered by Doris Markart from um, the European Commission. Thanks, Doris, for, for being here. Our event is uh, focused, of course, on cloud edge and IoT innovations uh, in agriculture and crisis uh, management. And we'll talk also about the relation with other spaces. So after Doris' uh, introduction, we'll have some presentations from Aloxi uh, representatives and from uh, AgriData Space Project. And then we'll have a full hour of presentations of relevant use cases uh, by uh, meta operating system uh, projects and by AgriData Space. We'll have also a moment to promote uh, open calls, so funding opportunities for you if you're working in Cloud Edge and IoT. And then we'll close with a panel discussion with some of the speakers of today's uh, event. Um, we'll have also time uh, at the end of the event for Q&A, but please don't limit yourself to asking questions at the end. Use every moment you want to an animate the chat. Okay, our pleasure is if uh, uh, the chat is full with comments, questions, and uh, even if you want to use it to present yourself and to network a little bit, uh, we're happy uh, that you do this. So we try to, to leverage on the networking effect, although uh, this is an online uh, event. Uh, so you can use the chat or the Q&A function, or if you want to speak, you, you raise your hand and we give you the floor. The session is recorded, as I said, and everything, the slides and the video will be available uh, in the coming days. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to this introduction, and I now will leave uh, the floor uh, directly to Doris uh, Markart from uh, the European Commission for uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, Doris. Mm -hmm. uh, can, we cannot hear you, Doris. Uh, for yes, um, now, can yes. you see my screen? Now, yes, now it works. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you for the invitation to the webinar. Um, to the organizers, but also to all contributing projects. I think it's very nice that you align efforts and that you organize yourself and organize the exchange of information. I'm Doris Marquardt from DG Connect Unit E4 IoT, and the unit is also focusing on three sectors, agriculture, energy, and mobility. So we are well placed here to accompany the webinar and also best regards for my colleague Jan, um, which is policy officer and project officer for some of the projects. Thank you. So as we have a tough agenda and a straightforward agenda, I would like to use the opportunity to over only find, uh, provide a brief overview and call the attention to some aspects and highlight why your work and the work of the project is important for the policies, policy ambitions, and encourage you to consider some aspects in future, if not already done. So 
let's say, if you have Horizon Europe or other European Union funding programs and have calls, it's mostly linked to the expectations that funding materialized and contributes to achieving policy ambitions. So in the field of agriculture, without going into detail, relevant, for instance, are the Green Deal, the Digital Age, but also better regulation and reducing administrative burdens, ripened innovation ecosystems, or resilient and competitive agriculture sector and vibrant rural areas. So mostly you find it reflected if you have a call for, let's say, proposals, there is a link to policy ambitions. And one key message here is, we strongly encourage you to demonstrate how projects at the end have the potential to contribute to policy ambitions, also at the end and not only at proposal stage. And for that, I will not go into detail of the policy cycle, but I would strongly encourage you to use the opportunity if you have project results, interim results, to seek, let's say, through the project or policy offices accompanying your project, to see the interlink and how far results are relevant for the policy cycle. We are not only looking and waiting for project results at the end of the project. Your support may already be helpful, for instance, for studies, impact assessments, you name it. So we are looking for an active policy science interface and valuable work. And you will see that interim results are also relevant to inform, for instance, future programming because your lessons learned and your results matter. So, and one other message resulting from the slide, there's not only about policymakers and scientists, which we are consider, let's say, in the innovation ecosystem, but also the end users for in agriculture, the farmers, for instance, the industry and <clears throat> manufacturers along the supply chains. So meaning have a realistic view. And I think it's also already well reflected on, let's say, the stakeholders you invited to the webinar. And I think um, it will probably be a nice exchange, let's say, of views. <clears throat> Let's briefly reflect, I think most of you are familiar with Horizon Europe um, and the strategic plan for 21-24. So two messages are important for the, let's say, agenda today, which I would really like to recall. And the cluster six, let's say, is a cluster where we focus, among others, on agriculture, more specifically, digitalization in agriculture, but also in food, is already high on the agenda. And you will probably know all some of the projects already funded under the work program 21-22. You see in the left corner, without going into detail, there is a broad field already covered where we see potential of agriculture and digitization through research and innovation being promoted. I would like <clears throat> that now currently we are in the implementation of the work program 23-24. And at the same time, and that is why I said the active, let's say, continuous exchange between projects and policymakers is important, we are already looking and planning the work program 25-26. So for us, it's quite important what does work research and innovation wise, what do we have achieved, where are knowledge gaps, and maybe there are also challenges where research, um, let's say, was not successful, and we have to, let's say, have a closer look together at it, do we need follow-up projects, for instance. And so far, also the exchanges with the projects are quite relevant for us at the current stage. This, let's say, slide presents one overview. So the main ambition is to come from research to innovation and finally to deployment, meaning with innovative solutions reach the end user, be it the farmer, the public administration, the food processor. So you have different target groups in your process, uh, in your projects. You see here a lot of activities, and I cannot introduce within 10 minutes all of them. But if you are not familiar with those activities on those as a slide, I strongly encourage you to follow up on those because the main ambition you see in the left corner, you see horizon projects are an essential cornerstone for the innovation ecosystem, a starting point which can, can inform future innovation actions, for instance, under the European Digital Innovation Hubs, or they might be scaled up under testing and experimentation facilities for AI, or where you focus on contribute to the development or later also to, of the use of the agricultural data space. 
the Horizon Europe Partnership Agriculture of Data is forthcoming, but there, for instance, also a number of Horizon projects mailing up to inform the partnership and, uh, let's say, the results of relevant projects in the field agriculture of data may be bundled and scaled up through the partnership as well. So I'll provide this slide as an invitation to have a closer look on you and see, okay, how your project fits into that picture and how the results may contribute to this overall innovation ecosystem and strategic programming, which we have as an interplay between Horizon Europe Cluster 4 Horizon Europe Cluster 6 and the Digital Europe Program. And for sure, for the overall support of digitalization in agriculture, also other programs are relevant, like the Common Agriculture Policy, but we will not focus on that today. One main message is innovation. So developing the innovative solution is fine. So, but then we have to go one step further. So first of all, and that is mostly done already in cluster six of Horizon Europe, we have to consider the specific socioeconomic and environmental condition and in digitalization, what is also quite relevant for making innovative solutions scalable, the legal framing conditions, which are currently changing a lot in the field of digital and data technologies. So meaning innovation has to reach the end user. And otherwise, let's say, it would not be effective and the solution. So meaning from the innovative side, be it a university, a startup and so on, you are looking for having at the end for bringing the innovative solution to the market, a sustainable business model. On the other side, if you look on the right hand side, the end user um, ideally has the capacities to effective use the innovative solutions. So ideally, the innovative process goes with feedback groups between end user and innovator. And on both sides, a lot of capacity building and networking is needed. Capacity building means, for instance, for the side of the innovators, they have to be familiar with legal conditions, socioeconomic conditions, and so on. The end user might have, let's say, the need for not only financial resources, but also the capacities to understand the abstract matters of data, and digital technologies or to gain trust. So that is an overall, let's say, simplified picture of the innovation, innovation ecosystem. So meaning if you look at the interplay of innovator and innovative solutions and the end user, we know on the one side, digital solutions has the potential to strengthen the environmental and, and economic performance of the agriculture sector. On the other hand, we are well aware of that this potential is not fully exploited. And let's say researchers and startups have to consider the challenges and barriers in the agriculture domain, which may hamper the uptake of digital solution. This is particularly relevant to cost effectiveness of some digital solutions, the trust in technologies, legal barriers, awareness of digital technologies, lack of digital skills, but also in some regions, a lack of infrastructure and services, for instance, broadband or repair services. So, and the overall question, which role can research and innovation play at the end, if it really comes to the end solution in supporting policies, ambitions, the digitalization, agriculture, and farm to fork ambitions? So, and here it's an essential role for you to play, namely research and innovation. And here I encourage you um, to consider the following aspect presented on the slides, meaning focus on your project. How can we increase the cost effectiveness on digital solution? How can we enhance the performance assessment opportunities? What are digital solutions actually delivering? So that is relevant for the farmers that you can present with hard figures. What is the benefit of a digital tool? but also relevant for policymakers when they decide should they support the investments into a digital tool. Developing technical solutions, facilitating trust and data sharing is in agriculture all, also a key component to be considered. And in addition, demonstration effects, for instance, through pilot projects, and that is why I also welcome the agenda today. I think that is very relevant in the agriculture sector to present the use cases, go out and show what they can deliver in practice and in feasible terms. 
then for sure, research and innovation should be need driven and consider the development of business models and capacity building. And to some extent, the task of capacity building and business models we have already included for many projects in cluster six of Horizon Europe. So let me conclude. We know most of the ICO posts in this webinar that digital solution can contribute to enhancing the performance of the agriculture sector and to contribute to achieve policy ambitions, particularly in the field of environment and the economy. It is essential to demonstrate the effects of digital tools and their making them feasible and also underpin them with hard figures for both the end user to convince them to invest into it or to take the step and learn about them and also for policymakers to see, okay, what can digital who will actually deliver. So from our side, from the commission side, we will say key instruments to promote innovation and innovative digital solutions in agriculture are already there at European level, Horizon Europe, Digital Europe, but also other tools, for instance, the common agriculture policy. So what is now essential that, let's say, the innovation ecosystem and the actors in it and you saw at the beginning, it's not only about scientists and users and policymakers, but the whole value chain has to use this, those tools in an effective manner and also consider the overall landscape of projects, initiatives out there and to consider how they can potentially link up to the other initiatives, benefit them or contribute to them. So for being effective, the instruments and the innovative solutions in the development need to consider the socioeconomic, environmental, and legal framing conditions. So and ideally, we manage then to achieve synergies, not only between the projects like today, which is great, but going one step further between research and innovation initiatives, programs, and also between countries as it regards, for instance, use cases or later in the inflation at deployment stage between different initiatives, for instance, regional data spaces. And you mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's the opportunities to promote open calls. Also from our side, from the commission side, we would like to call your attention that the goal for the deployment action for the common European agriculture data space will open end of February until May at the 24. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I'm for sure also ready to address questions in the chat or later in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, virtual applause uh, for you. I found your <clears throat> presentation pretty interesting, especially in uh, you know the ecosystem of review and the final suggestions that you gave. I don't know if we have already any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. I don't see them immediately. Uh, but I think you, you can stay on a little bit uh, more, right? Um, so, so to um, address... Oh, I have someone who raised their hand, Marie. Um, Marie, can you type your question in the, in the chat, if possible? Okay. And uh, while we wait for the question to, to come, so we don't, uh, you know, uh, stop the flow of presentations, I'd like to ask uh, Golbu, welcome Golbu, to share your screen and give uh, the overview of uh, Aloxii. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Golbu Purabdulayan from IDC. Uh, I'm the coordinator of Unlock CI project. Um, and also from my side, welcome. is a coordination support action, is one of the coordinated support actions of the EU Cloud Edge IoT uh, initiative. Uh, the other one is Open Continuum. Unlock CI is mainly focused on the demand side of the computing continuum. And why, I mean, what is the context of the project and why the project is born 
is based on the fact that we see that in the market, in the European market, the investment in the edge is increasing. So we see that by 2026, it's going to reach to $75 billion. However, still at the level of adoption, we see that the industrial stakeholders struggle to adopt the, the solutions on the computing continuum and struggle to do the paradigm shift. So um, the mission that Unlock CI has is to uh, do this deep dive into the market from different perspectives to the demand market of Cloud Edge IoT and uh, provide support to the uh, to the supply side um, and to research innovation actions um, in terms of uh, identifying that what are the demand drivers, what are the value chain dynamics, what are the service requirements, what some insights about the market commercial feasibility, uh, what are the ad adoption level le uh, levels of the use cases. So these insights in order to support them to bridge the gap between the supply and demand. Um, we have a consortium of six partners and we started our journey in uh, June 2022. So um, very quickly, if you talk about the adoption of Cloud Edge IoT in the agriculture sector here, you can see that um, the adoption of the three uh, technological element of the computing continuum in agriculture in Europe. So no, no surprise that we can see that uh, cloud is, is just moving forward. So mainly uh, the adoption is related to cloud. IoT and edge are not really that much currently, but uh, the, the perspective is that they are gonna increase in the future. Um, this, these are the results that have been uh, collected through the uh, market research and the survey that we did in, in Unlock CI um, with 700 interviews. Um, and if we want to look at the agriculture sector uh, in terms of adoption compared to the other sectors in Europe, here we can have a very interesting observation. Because as you can see here in the blue part, um, even though the current adoption of edge um, is uh, in agriculture is not really uh, high, actually it's low compared to other sectors such as manufacturing, such, such as energy. However, we can see in the green, green parts of the charts that the perspective is quite promising for the agriculture. So basically 31% uh, of the European players in agriculture expressed that in the next two years, they are planning to use edge solutions um, uh, for uh, for agriculture, and this is uh, this this basically highlights the fact that even though now agriculture may seem that lags behind the other sectors in terms of the computing continuum and edge adoption, but the expectations and the forecast is that in the near future it's going to recover the gap and it is just uh, accelerate quickly to to um to reach this adoption uh, adoption on a level uh, like the other sectors. And here, um, one interesting thing is that there will be the key role of the elements that also Doris mentioned in her uh, in her presentation, such as the role of data spaces, because obviously adoption of these technologies is closely linked with the adoption and deployment of the data spaces. Um, if you want to look at the drivers and benefits uh, that basically pushes the agriculture players into adoption uh, of the edge, um, the interesting observation that we have we have is that we can see that mainly the drivers are network related. So we can see that the main drivers for them are overcoming the unreliable connectivity, uh, the very low cost latency, reducing the volume of data set across networks. And somehow it makes sense when you think about the uh, agriculture use cases, because in the agriculture use cases, basically we are talking about a wide area, not a focus area like manufacturing, for instance. Um, and then talking about the use cases, we also did some analysis about the what are the uh, most adopted um, CI use cases uh, in agriculture and what are the ones that are being planned to be adopted in future. And here on the right, you can see the results. And as you can see, currently, it seems that the all the use cases, which are somehow related to um, precision farming to uh, farming 4.0, such as asset monitoring, such as visual inspection, uh, and for quality control, such as video security and surveillance, all of them are currently the ones that are uh, more popular, uh, let's say, in terms of the adoption. However, there are use cases that currently don't have a, a high level of adoption rate. 
but the expectation is that the forecast is that they're going to be adopted um, uh, in a wide range uh, in the future. And for instance, one of them, which you can see at the bottom of the chart is the autonomous vehicle, that the forecast is that in the near future, in the next two years, autonomous vehicles in the field of agriculture uh, with the with the uh, facilitation of technologies such as uh, 5G, 6G will really will be adopted much more uh, in the agriculture sector. Um, I I really don't have much time, and I don't want to get uh, other um, uh, speakers' time because they, I, I'm sure they have many many interesting insights to share. Just to tell you that uh, we have several reports uh, within uh, which have been uh, generated within the project. I um, invite everyone to check the uh, website of EuCloud HIOT, download the reports and read them, and hopefully you can find some interesting uh, insights from there. So thank you very much. Um, and Maria, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Golbu. I copied the link also in the chat and the speakers coming after after Golbu. If you want to use the chat to share other links to your initiatives, feel free to, to do that. Now it's uh, time for Inessa. So Inessa also from uh, LOXI, uh, from VDI, um, to present uh, dynamics, value chain dynamics in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, so the floor, the floor is yours, Inessa. Welcome. Thank you very much, Maria, and fair, thank you very much for organizing this webinar. And so there is a strong connection between the agri data space and um, Unlock CI, and we also were happy to um, host and invite the participants of the agri data space also in our workshop who provided valuable um, uh, contribution to, to the project. And uh, so I'll try to share my slides. Um, I hope this is the right. Um, screen. So. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, not yet, Inessa. If you not want, yet. I can um, or maybe one now. second. Yes. Now, now, should, now, now it works. Yes. So, um, the purpose of Unlock uh, Cloud Edge IoT is to fill the gap, to understand the demands um, and uh, purchase decisions and criteria um, that are needed uh, for further adoption of Cloud Edge IoT um, solutions. And uh, we try to gain insights on market and commercial feasibility and thanks to Golbu and RDC we have a um, solid background that we can build on and um, in our uh, case so um, so our approach was to understand um, who is involved in a value chain, in a data-driven value chain, and um, to establish a dialogue with the um, key stakeholders of the value chains. And um, in the scope of Unlock CIA, we addressed five sectors, and one of the sectors is agriculture. And I, I think it was one of the most interesting ones. So how we uh, how we proceed? So we had a first uh, workshop wave where we discussed um, what were the major business drivers um, and what were the revenue uh, flows and data flows in value chain networks and where could be found uh, vendor lock-ins or gaps and also business opportunities. And um, so we come up uh, with the following value chain, which involves, uh, of course, also Cloud Edge IoT um, suppliers and machinery suppliers. Um, we see here today John Deere. Um, so there is also um, Class uh, and and some other uh, machinery suppliers who are capturing and collecting the data on, on the crop fields. And um, so they are 
farmers um, and uh, livestock um, uh, players and, and of course the, so they have their own associations, um, industry association, farmer associations, um, and um, uh, there are lots of IT application and hardware providers, um, and of course, uh, different uh, data sharing initiatives. <laughs> we didn't want, we wanted to separate the term of data spaces and data sharing initiatives because they all are different. And uh, food processing companies and suppliers and um, at the end of the value chain are trade and um, retail companies and um, the data floors address all the value chain and uh, we conducted in-depth interviews with uh, major stakeholders of the of this value chain and uh, and of course also with participants um, and partners from agri data space project and as you can see so we have uh, so these arrows show uh, value floor and data floor and information floor and goods floor and we identified, uh, for example, um, uh, SI technologies and software and specific actors uh, with Cloud Edge IoT relevance. And of course, um, actors that belong to the agricult agricultural supply chain. And we see here, we have to deal with hardware providers and infrastructure providers and data-driven service providers and uh, machinery providers and, and vendors. So they're actually very, uh, he are heavily involved in collecting the data and processing the data and understanding um, how they can make their machines better and how th they can use the data uh, for, uh, for providing better services for the farmers. And we have here, we can see intermediaries. And uh, for example, Ag Data Hub is one of such intermediaries. And we also identified that will be one of the next slides that, that there, there are lots of data sharing initiatives that already share and, and um, Of course, we have um, already existing uh, software for farm management and <clears throat> Uh, of course, uh, public authorities uh, play a significant role um, regarding um, the quality and uh, regulations uh, that uh, help all of us and make our food systems more sustainable and, of course, secure. Uh, so uh, this is the overview that we generated to understand um, how the data flow uh, flows, how the revenue uh, flow, um, and uh, which kind of information is exchanged between um, these uh, different stakeholders. And of course, it is um, more interesting to understand. So you can see, so this is the slide from Agri Data Space. You can see that uh, data sharing already takes place and data sharing. Um, so we, uh, our partners uh, from Ilvo found 440 initiatives and uh, 140 initiatives that answered the surveys. Um, and uh, well, it's it's very much momentum that um, has to be leveraged in in order to um, provide uh, new services uh, for for the farmers, for the uh, stakeholders, uh, and, and 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 to cover the whole value chain. Um, so this is an overview about some example uh, data sharing initiatives such as Eden. Agri Router and Ag Data uh, Hub. I don't want to go into detail. I just want to mention that um, regarding their services and regarding uh, so where the data is collected and stored, we find out that all these solutions are cloud centric, which is, um, well, <laughs> cloud centric. Um, 
uh, in the sense that uh, the big tech uh, players, hyperscalers like Microsoft Azure and AWS um, and uh, Google, so all, all these players participate and, um, and actually, well, they don't manage this data, but this is where the data is stored. And um, so um, if, if you look at the value chain, um, you can see that um, uh, all, all the data is some, all, all the value chain will be covered um, and um, all, all this data will be somehow centrally stored at cloud-based facilities. And it's a big question who will be in charge of this data. And uh, so that is why I think the work of AgriData Space uh, as a project is also very important to provide recommendations how, how to deal with infrastructures and um, how can we establish a fair data economy where all different um, stakeholders, farmers, machinery providers, IT providers, um, information management uh, system providers, um, robotics solution providers, whatever, how they can um, share the data and how can they participate um, in data sharing, but still these data sharing economy remains transparent, neutral and fair. So I think these are the last words <laughs> I want to say. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I'm happy to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inissa. Uh, as I said before, uh, you, you can uh, use this time to ask your question in the chat or Q&A box. Um, yeah, I see someone who raised their hand, but possibly it's better, I think, if you if you write the question. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'd like um, to leave uh, the floor to Ziak Wolfert. Not sure if I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly. Welcome. Um, I think you should have also some slides. Uh, so we uh, now investigate the uh, data space section more closely of this event um, with the presentation of uh, AgriData Space uh, project. So thank you for being here. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. I yes. think you can see my slides. We, we can. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Also, thanks to uh, Inessa, who already introduced more or less a little bit the AgriData Space project. Um, my name is uh, Jacques Wolfert, I'm from Wageningen Economic Research, and I'm the uh, scientific coordinator of the Aggregated Space Project. Yeah, so before I dive into the project itself, I first want to give some background and some context. I'm not going into detail uh, on this slide. Maybe you have seen it before, I presented it already in several other uh, occasions. Uh, but maybe uh, quickly, uh, you see here uh, a diagonal uh, along two axes. The, the X axis uh, shows the IT integration level ranging from standalone applications at the left uh, to system of systems at the right. And at the Y axis, the, the more the organizational aspect of, of uh, uh, ICT and agri-food uh, ranging from a single process operator, which can, for example, be a farm or a farm worker or somebody else in the supply chain towards uh, complex business ecosystems. Uh, and you'll see here that you can, if you um, yeah, look at the diagonal, uh, you see at the, at the more technical side uh, that you can speak of single apps and, and further integration into farm information systems, chain information systems. And then here, uh, Ines was already referring to the term, uh, sometimes you can call them data platforms or data uh, hubs. Uh, we call them an aggregate space now, data sharing initiative. So, yeah, it, you can always discuss about the uh, the complete uh, definition, but uh, let's call them data sharing initiatives. And above that, um, uh, data spaces. Uh, so the idea of what I already want to introduce here is that these data spaces are a kind of integration or maybe better a federation of all these below lying uh, systems. And at the right side, of course, you see the application um, uh, where they have to be applied. 
And so uh, let's look, look at these data spaces. Um, they should serve a food data economy uh, and also more uh, integrated food systems. And more importantly, uh, I put over here uh, that I think um, we want to address sustainability challenges. Uh, we have, we uh, specifically have to focus in, in this area uh, where data spaces will play an increasingly um, yeah, major role. Of course, you can have, for example, single apps that uh, improve nitrogen use efficiency, so uh, to address this sustainability issue. Uh, but um, we have learned that uh, sustainability requires more integrated solutions where you can integrate yeah, all kind of different data. So in the end, uh, when you talk about data spaces, not only agricultural data, uh, but uh, if there are also other data spaces, for example, from health or from the environment or mobility or energy, uh, you can also combine uh, more data to have a more integrated sustainable solution for uh, the sustainability uh, challenges. And of course, as I try to indicate a little bit with this picture, IoT and, and edge systems uh, somewhere also play a very important role in the whole development of creating these data sharing initiatives and also data spaces. Well, uh, so far this picture, if you want to have a more detailed uh, background, uh, I refer to the article and the paper that is here at the, at the right uh, where you can go. So um, in the data, Agri Data Space project, we, we look at these data sharing initiatives as being um, initiatives on the, let's say, the micro level. Um, so I, uh, Inessa already gave some examples. I will also show a little bit more. Uh, so most of them are targeting a specific sector or, for example, only uh, targeting agricultural machinery uh, companies. Um, uh, so that's the micro level. Uh, but uh, the common European agricultural data space is more on the macro level. And as I already indicated, um, we consider it as a kind of federation of data sharing initiatives, as is also visualized here uh, in this picture below. So this is another example of a, a DSI uh, in, a, in a graphic way, um, the uh, Ag in scope. So you see here at the left, I think there are especially also the, the IoT um, devices uh, playing a role, uh, all kind of machinery and also the use of, of satellites and drones are, are being used uh, to generate all kind of data to support uh, management uh, of the agricultural uh, value chain. Um, and through OEM platforms, uh, they are um, yeah, uh, uh, integrated or federated in this peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. And at the right, you see more the application side, uh, which can be farmers or farmers advisors. Uh, but you see also here, for example, representing the government or uh, the administration uh, that is also able to use uh, these data. Uh, so this is what we mean by data sharing initiatives. Uh, and of course, uh, it's always easy to, to draw these kind of pictures with all nice uh, connections and lines. Uh, but yeah, the, the reality is, of course, uh, very challenging to really, uh, um, yeah, to really uh, deploy this in, in practice. So we um, uh, picture a, a high level architecture uh, consisting of three different layers. Uh, so starting with the, the upper layer uh, I just introduced, and you see here also some other uh, names of, of possible examples of these data sharing initiatives. And um, they uh, should use all kind of domain specific uh, software infrastructure, uh, as you can see here, like Isobus, uh, which is, is much more in the, in the uh, precision agriculture uh, area, uh, but also GS1, which is more into the supply chain, uh, OGC with uh, refer referring to all kind of geospatial uh, data. Uh, so these are more domain specific for agriculture, uh, but they should also use the more generic um, infrastructure uh, such as Gaia X, uh, Fireware, iShare, etc., uh, which is, uh, I think, still uh, something for for the future. Um, so yeah, that is what we uh, see as a as a as a high level architecture. Uh, Inessa was already showing this, uh, so you uh, can go to this um, yeah, interactive map uh, where we mapped, uh, and I counted this this afternoon, we have now 454 data sharing initiatives uh, identified, and of course, um, a lot of them are very immature or maybe just a kind of initial project, uh, but uh, yeah, this is the, the current, current status. 
and then the the, the project itself is um, uh, working towards a roadmap and different scenarios for this common uh, European agricultural data space, uh, looking at um, scenarios uh, for governance. So what are the possible um, yeah, options for uh, governing uh, such a, a data space at the European level? Uh, so we are looking at the various um, opportunities for um, yeah, legal bodies, um, but also um, if they should uh, have a, a membership model or other uh, models. Uh, so that is, that is what we are currently uh, looking at. And actually, uh, Inessa is also uh, leading this task. So I refer also to her for more uh, detailed information. At the same time, and which is very much what is very much related, uh, is the business model. Uh, so what, what should be the business model of this common European agricultural data space in connection to all the data sharing initiatives? And we already said uh, that uh, we should avoid that uh, this becomes a kind of Uber platform or a platform of platforms uh, that's taking over all these data sharing initiatives. That won't work. Uh, so we believe that um, yeah, most of the business is taking place at the data sharing initiative level, uh, but somehow also the common uh, data space should have um, yeah, a, a stake in, in this whole uh, business model. Uh, so we're also working on various scenarios for that. Uh, the same holds for the technical interoperability part. Uh, so referring to the architecture I just showed, we identified several uh, mechanisms how we can uh, work on this interoperability. Uh, so also there we have various uh, building blocks identified uh, and different scenarios for that. And finally, uh, we are also looking at the ethical, uh, legal and social uh, aspects, uh, also known as ELSA nowadays. Uh, so especially, of, of course, the um, influence or the context uh, that is provided by the different acts, the, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, and, and other acts that are coming up, um, but also at ethical questions, um, uh, be uh, because um, data is also power. Uh, so how can we avoid power imbalances, or uh, how can we make um, yeah, this common data space also in a fair and inclusive way? And therefore, we can also link up with many other projects that Doris was also referring to uh, in Horizon Europe that are working on, on this uh, topic. So this is the, the roadmap uh, for the long term. So at the, at the left, you see the current project, uh, which is still, let's say, the exploratory stage. Um, uh, Doris referred to the call that is now uh, open or will open at the end of the month for deployment of, of the roadmap. And so that will be done over here. And then, um, yeah, on the longer term, we expect that there will be an operational common European uh, data space. So, yeah, that was in a, in a brief, in brief, the um, agri data space project. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jacques, uh, very much. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, exploit this moment. Don't wait uh, the end of of the of the event. Um, we are about to start now the use case presentations. Uh, we will focus now on the MetaOS, Meta Operating System uh, projects that are part of EU Cloud IoT uh, cluster. Uh, we'll have um, all the six projects presenting and also uh, an overview of use cases that are followed by AgriData Space. So I'll start with Nebulos. Uh, we have two use cases from Nebulos. One will be presented by Vasilis Zaridis, and it's about precision agriculture. The other one will be presented by Amir Azimian uh, on crisis management. That's also the other subtopic of today's event. Um, so, um, Vasilis, um, please, uh, you can start sharing the screen. Remember, you have max seven minutes uh, to present, um, and you can open the, the webcam and share your screen uh, now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone. I'm Vasilis, representing uh, Augmenta Precision Agriculture Technologies, which is a use case partner of Nebulous Project. Um, uh, Nebulous is a meta uh, operating system uh, for brokering high, hyper distributed application on cloud uh, computing. Uh, 
Uh, our vision for this project is to develop a meta operating system that seamlessly exploit edge and uh, fog nodes in conjunction uh, with multi cloud resources uh, to cope with requirements uh, posed by low latency applications. Okay, a few words about Augmenta. Our, co our company is located in Athens, Greece and specializes in providing advanced automation solutions to uh, farmers, farmers uh, aimed at optimizing agricultural practices. Uh, our innovative technologies are designed to reduce um, chemical usage while enabling, enabling uh, farmers to maximize their yields and have an optimal management of their applications. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, as of March of 2023, Augmenta became a member of CNH Industrial Group. Uh, Augmenta use case methodol methodology refers to integra integration of uh, cloud edge processing, uh, reallocation of data streams to local resources and uh, session based alert generation. Uh, the main goals uh, are to um, optimize of resource usage for data collection and processing uh, to increase the management capabilities uh, through platforms orchestrations and of course data security uh, through authentication processes. Um, in this slide, uh, you can see our main technologies. Uh, first, we have the Augmenta Field Analyzer, our cutting edge uh, device equipped with multi spectrum cameras uh, and advanced algorithms. Uh, this device scans plant health in real time and accurately calculates and applies the appropriate dosage of chemicals. Uh, following the completion of a field operation, the gathered data is transmitted to the cloud for the post-processing phase. This phase yields essential insights, um, including uh, farmers' application maps and reports on chemical and uh, money savings. Uh, lastly, uh, all this information uh, is accessible through a user-friendly cloud portal empowering farmers to optimize their field management practices. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, in our in our use case, uh, our use case aims to leverage nebulous uh, to deliver more precise uh, agronomical insights to every farmer following uh, of the completion of each field of operation. Uh, this will this can be achieved through utilization of edge computing and intelligent resource management mechanisms. Yes, here you can see uh, the integration of our uh, use case a diagram. Uh, of our integration with Nebulous. Uh, so uh, after, uh, let's say, a field operation completion, the gathered data transmitted to Nebulous through nearby 5G nodes, then Nebulous, by utilizing each sophisticated mechanism, determines uh, the optimal resource type required uh, for efficient data processing and then uh, proceeds to deployment and the execution of the uh, code that will uh, produce the insights mentioned beforehand. And finally, transfer the results uh, to uh, cl a cloud infrastructure. Uh, this process ensures that farmers can swiftly access comprehensive insights into their operations. Uh, facilitating them with uh, the power of quick decision-making and enhancing the overall management. Uh, okay, finally, the benefits of using Nebulous platform. 
will be very crucial for us. As a recap, Nebula Solution will provide um, optimal utilization uh, of edge or cloud resources for its running uh, task. A smart orchestration mechanism uh, that will allocate and uses only the necessary resources each time. And of course, uh, security uh, and of course, uh, high, uh, high speed data transmission, uh, leveraging the 5G technologies. Uh, what do we expect after that? Uh, in summary, uh, we aim to see significant savings in our cloud cost with utilization of edge computing. Plus, we expect a big reduction in processing time uh, thanks to smarter resource uh, management, uh, which this means uh, we can uh, process more tasks in less time as well, boosting our overall productivity. And Finally, in terms of uh, actual uh, numbers and KPIs, uh, we expect a reduction uh, of processing time about 30% with a baseline of 15 uh, and cloud cost reduction at 10% uh, and decrease of processing capabilities at 10%. Uh, uh, I think that's all from my side. Here are all the partners of Nebulus and some social media uh, stuff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vasilis. I copied some of your links already in the chat. Uh, also, Anna put some others. So uh, if there is anything else you want to point the audience to, feel free to do that. Uh, we stay um, with Nebulos uh, as well. Uh, so as I said, now we have the crisis management um, use case with Amir. Hello, Amir. Welcome. Feel free to share the screen right now. So we uh, go on with your use case. And again, feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat. Yeah, I hope you can see and hear me and my presentation well enough. <laughs> Uh, so I start, um, I'm representing the, the use case disaster management or crisis management by the Nobulus. Um, um, I'm working, uh, we are based, uh, our organization is based on volunteer work, but due to this project, I'm working uh, full time, so to speak, as a research association. But in our team, I'm a planning and information management. So without any confusion, that was about me, about the organization. It's um, basically a network of the different, uh, let's say people, specialists in different fields, uh, which tries and do so in two different specific uh, uh, category of disaster. One is wildland firefighting and the other one is urban search and rescue try to be more internationally deployed. Um, and uh, we have been uh, the member of INSARAC. We've been being classified in 2021 as the first light team. And we have also developed other units. Um, about the theory, I try to be short enough. Um, the crisis management, uh, we have to understand usually in the early days or early hours of a uh, crisis, we need a lot of information uh, and we need a lot of processing. And usually because the infrastructure is already gone or, uh, or hugely damaged, uh, there is no capacity to be used. And therefore our objective is to, let's say, uh, bring our own calculation capacities to the field and also covering a bit of communication capacity with that uh, calculation uh, capacity or power, so to speak. The picture, as you see, it's actually recently or a year before in Tokai, which is obvious why we do need to take our <laughs> calculation capacity with ourselves. Um, just to uh, give you a better um, picture. 
Uh, our slogan is usually says, uh, coordination saves lives. Uh, my, let's say, slogans add to that in this project is coordination needs information, information needs data, and data needs to be managed as well, which is, I think, obvious to all of you. Um, data need to be managed and we have to make sense of data, uh, especially in early stages, which a lot of unknown or or unvalidated data is flooding to the, let's say, coordination set. Uh, as I said, the infrastructure is usually not available or not uh, functioning enough. Uh, the picture I love to share usually from the United Nations handbook for the UNDAC teams is uh, we don't need to be super accurate about the data. We just need to be good enough in the early stages. Therefore, we come to the idea of bringing our own and our uh, question or requirement at the beginning of the project, which made a lot of, let's say, challenges for other partners. We wanted to be a standalone application and also be offline, which probably sounds here in this conversation a bit uh, off the topic, uh, but that's the reality we have to face. But I think this challenge also provides some benefits to other partners and also the applications itself. <clears throat> and um, we have experience and we have application which we already, let's say, developed it during the flooding in Germany in 2021. That map is still online, I believe, uh, which we basically kind of uh, visualize all the data which collected during our assessments um, to the to the map, which was online, everyone could access it, and um, which was very beneficial. Come back to the application, the Nublus, um, just to give you an overview, uh, how would it be look like, let's say, um, uh, if it, that's the application in between, we need to calculate this stuff, so to speak. And we have IoT sensors or devices to collect more valuable information during a disaster or in the early stages. And when the connectivity is there, we can also, let's say, add more uh, data layer to it. Before anyone raised the questions, uh, which always I face that questions, why we don't use satellite communication? First, it's probably not available. Uh, second, maybe it's available, but it's not allowed. And third, uh, sometimes it's forbidden, and uh, to your surprise, which unfortunately it's a good example, during the Germany uh, flooding in July 2021, some nice picture from before and some picture from after, and this radio telescope, 100 meter, is that I think F-spec is exactly located near to this flooding area, which if you we don't want to advertise, but if you check with the providers, uh, map coverage, uh, this area exactly is forbidden to get satellite communication. And with that said, we would enjoy this benefit, which uh, we will see. And we want to be offline as much as possible and stand alone let's say offline and standalone to start the application and the calculation capacity. And therefore I called it, it's an open conversations. Maybe we can call it a field cloud. I don't know, I'm not an expert on that field, but uh, for now we can call it a field cloud. It, it will enable us to start our uh, computing even with small components and we can scale it up as much as, let's say, other units or other calculation capacity will be added to the field. Uh, and therefore, when there is a connectivity, we can ramp it up to the clouds and access more uh, calculations. Uh, has to be light uh, for us. Uh, each uh, kilogram uh, costs a lot of money, especially during those early stages. So that's from me, uh, our partners, and the social medias, if anyone has a question.
Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Um, I think we have one question in the in the chat from Mario. Who asks, uh, why do you not see more benef uh, benefits uh, by introducing edge AI solutions? Such benefits um, could be reduced power consumption in the overall system, real time application, uh, increased security, efficient processing in the edge, and contribute to sustainability. I don't know if you have any comments on this observation. If the question audience is me, um, I don't necessarily know what does mean edge AI solutions for crisis management, uh, but I can assure you uh, um, we have a lot of problems to, uh, let's say, integrate any kind of solution to the existing system uh, because of the data security, because of different organizations and many stakeholders which are usually involved. Therefore, they have different policies and you need all of them in early stages to collaborate. Um, that's from me, so to speak. Thank you, Amir. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to this point raised in the chat. You can do so by um why um you, you can answer you know in the in the comment or we can keep it in the in the panel uh, as Andy suggests so uh, later in the in the event um I think uh, now we can move on with the other project presentation so we have ICOS in particular Arthur Jaborski from uh, PSNC for a agriculture uh, operational robotic platform use case. Thank you, Arthur. Good afternoon. I hope my presentation is visible. Uh, it is. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Arthur Jaworski. Uh, I work uh, at the Internet of Things Department in uh, Poznań Supercomputing and Networking Center. Uh, together with our partner, the Poznan Institute of Technology, uh, in the ICOS project, uh, we uh, work on the, uh, on a use case uh, that's uh, which is called which uh, is uh, named Agriculture Operational Robotic Platform or AORP, short. Uh, before diving into the uh, use case itself, I'd like to briefly present the ICOS project. Uh, ICOS stands for uh, IoT to Cloud uh, Operating System. Its uh, main goal is to uh, create a meta operating system that uh, heterogeneous uh, IoT devices uh, communicating uh, through various uh, uh, various communication protocols uh, could um, could use uh, to create a, a coherent uh, continuum architecture. Uh, ICOS strives at uh, optimizing uh, service execution as well as resources consumption. Uh, it addresses uh, trust, security, and privacy issues and uh, tries to keep the integration costs uh, as, as low as possible. Uh, so now let's, uh, let's see what uh, really AORP is. Um, AOR AORP is an agricultural robot uh, for use in white row crops. Uh, that uh, performs uh, field operations in an autonomous way. Uh, it, per it performs uh, precise operations of uh, sowing, weeding, and spraying. Uh, it's powered by a combustion engine and, um, and uses central tool attachment system. Uh, on board, we have a powerful uh, computer. Uh, as well as uh, multiple sensors, uh, cameras, uh, which uh, which are used to provide all the data that is needed to uh, both navigate the robot on the field uh, as well as uh, collect uh, collect information about the crop status. Um, so uh, what are main goals of AORP? The main goal is to reduce uh, farm operation costs by more effective use of resources. Uh, by using, uh, by performing precise operations, we mostly try to limit uh, plant protection products as uh, they don't need to be used on the whole field, 
just in the places where they are, they are needed. As a side goal, we try to promote and improve awareness of technolog technological impact in the agricultural community. Um, what uh, really is the brain of the of the AOR, AORP? Uh, the onboard computer uh, is being fed the data from from cameras, which is then uh, analyzed by AI-based image recognition system. Uh, this system uh, classifies all the um, all the plants uh, it can see in the picture, uh, and um, it can tell uh, which one is uh, is a crop that we that we are growing and which one is uh, is a wheat. And when the wheat is uh, is found on the on the field, it can then be extracted using uh, using a tool attached to a to a robot, uh, or it can be sprayed using herbicide. Uh, this approach uh, optimizes use of of herbicides on the field, as it's uh, only applied uh, in the place. Where the weeds are not not on the on the whole field. Um, where where do we see uh, benefits from integrating uh, with ICOS in um, in our project? Which parts do we want to use? Well, uh, first of all, ICOS simplifies deployment of software across all domains, which is uh, cloud, edge, and IoT devices. Uh, thanks to the fact that the data, uh, data is um, accessible almost instantly, it reduces the decision-making latency. Uh, thanks to the monitoring platform, uh, we will uh, increase the system availability. Uh, and by using uh, the intelligence layer, uh, we, uh, we, we will try to uh, improve our AI models uh, so that they are more accurate and more robust. And last but not least, uh, the coherent uh, continuum infrastructure uh, or architecture um, provides easy way of integrating new model, new modules into the system when uh, when they are needed. Um, and which uh, what are the key areas of um, of AORP that we want to uh, to improve by using this uh, this. Uh, uh, these whole modules, uh, these whole modules that IGOS provide. Uh, first of all, we uh, we want to further develop uh, the brains, which is the um, the crop management analytics in, as a whole. Uh, we also want to add uh, predictive maintenance of the machinery, uh, which means that uh, all the data coming from sensors mounted on the robot uh, on the engine. Uh, are fed into the AI models, which uh, try to detect any anomalies uh, to uh, predict uh, failures before they even happen, uh, so that we can plan uh, maintenance windows to replace worn parts and uh, keep the uh, downtime of the robot to, to minimum. Uh, we also want to improve uh, robot operations, uh, steering, uh, navigating the field, uh, obstacle avoidance, uh, as well as develop uh, farm and robot dashboards, which will uh, enable the end user to have a uh, quick glimpse at what what is going on uh, on his farm, what's the status of the robot, uh, if it's in emission, uh, if it's if it's available, and uh, as a as a further work, we are uh, considering. Um, performing field operations uh, in the swarms, which means that uh, a group of robots would be deployed on the field and work together to optimize the time taken to, uh, to perform the, the operation that is, that is needed. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. We did receive actually some question in the um, Q&A box, which are, I think, more general for the panel. I saw Ines already replied to, to the question in the chat, uh, but I, I will copy again uh, uh, the question and the answer provided so far uh, in the chat so you can all contribute. 
uh, to the general questions that uh, some people in the audience asked, and then we can uh, pick this up better later uh, in the panel discussion part, okay? So keep an eye on the chat. So I'll copy there uh, the question that comes in. Um, in the meantime, let's go on with the presentations. Uh, we are a little bit uh, behind schedule, so please uh, stick to the time. And now it's the turn of Nemo Antonios Gonos from uh, Enersoft. Um, welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, uh, I can hear you. Can you see and... the screen? I hope you do. Now, yes, thank you. Okay. So, hello, good evening from me. I'm Antonis Gonos, I'm from Entersoft, and I'm here representing the NEMO project, Next Generation Meta Operating System. And uh, I'm here to show you what we expect NEMO value will be in the smart farming trials. Okay. Okay, so what uh, a few words about NEMO. Uh, well, NEMO is uh, main focus is uh, transparent IoT to edge and to cloud continuum. It supports it supports intent based network and resource management. It's an open and modular meta OS, and uh, it has the ability to provide end to end intelligence, advanced automation and offer a massive uh, artificial intelligence artificial intelligence applications in the iot so in nemo we have two uh, cases of uh, uh, agricultural interest and they are both in organic olive groves yeah the groves are here in greece and uh, the challenges in organic olive oil production. So the main challenge is to manage the olive fruit fly. It has a, a complex pest life cycle and it's developed favorably in warm and wet conditions and has very limited approved organic pest controls. Uh, and also the climate change effects for, uh, the, the effects of high temperature environments are gender type dependent and the effect of the fruit fly is uh, three ways it affects the fruit weight the oil uh, the oil concentration and oil quality in a cultivar and de dependent mountain so uh, I'm sure you might, uh, in here in Greece, it's very interesting that uh, the lately we have a three, uh, two, uh, more than two-fold increase in olive prices, olive oil prices, and this is basically due to changes in the uh, climate, and it has affected a lot of uh, olive groves. So the smart farming use cases. We have two. The, uh, one is about aerial precision biospraying in the in the farm. In this use case, we will com we combine microclima data that are collected by uh, synthetic devices from Synelixis, which are IoT nodes in the in the grove, and also combined with real time video analysis of the olive growth from visual and multispectral cameras that are attached on semi autonomous drones and that are able to identify in real time where biospraying is needed. The biospraying decision uh, is based on uh, machine learning models which run on the end devices, uh, while we also have increased model performance and increased energy efficiency uh, through uh, uh, transferring the training process uh, through uh, with the Cyber Security Federated Deep Reinforcement Learning and deployment of the training jobs across the IoT, the Edge, and the cloud resources using the NEMO platform. Uh, 
you can see here that the, the type of uh, sensors and in, in the picture and the information we can generate we can get from uh, different sensors in the field what are the benefits from using this well uh, we we see that we, we are going to protect the olive trees from olive fruit fly through aerial spraying, spraying and uh, targeted spraying optimization of the use of biospraying without compromising the organic certification and we are going to efficiently and responsibly use the resources that are available in within the smart farm in the second use case we we are uh, similarly to the previous case we are using autonomous robots equipped with cameras and sensors that collect data and locate uh, weeds and in, the, in this way all I, uh, are able to do optimal precision spraying for with organic insecticide the use case relies on the machine learning models for the detection of the weeds as well as for the autonomous movement of the robots within the grove and it also detects uh, potential obstacles like uh, trees or humans which are present on the grove the machine learning services run on the robot or up the edge on the cloud or on the cloud server of the smart for the smart farm or even they can be moved uh, to another farm uh, if there is uh, an energy efficiency automatically through the, the use of NEMO uh, services and this actually guarantees the high quality of service In this use case, the expected benefits is the enhancement of the system biospraying with advanced multimodal machine learning models, which will lead to cost benefits for the farmer, uh, both by increased and high quality production and, and the, uh, less use of insecticides. And we also have increased energy efficiency through flexible deployment of services through the IoT edge and the cloud continuum, again, using the services provided by NEMO and finally we have a reduction of CO2 emission just by moving operation closer to the edge or exploiting green energy availability uh, so what is the the how uh, the, the the benefits of using NEMO in the smart farming application. So, we NEMO can manage the whole infrastructure. It uh, provides us with openness, so we can use different infrastructure uh, either in close to the in the IoT world on the edge on the cloud or different clouds and different of uh, uh, the availability of different farms and make sure that this is optimized for the cost for and it's also secure throughout the operation we are enable interoperability and end-to-end -end use of ai to manage the, all the data and the end users uh, we hope will be able to collaborate and uh, have the best uh, usefulness uh, the best uh, experience What we see as opportunities through Menlermo for the smart far uh, farming is easy portability among infrastructure providers, democratizing the use of smart agricultural device, which means that w we can share devices when we don't need them. We can transfer services through the uh, through devices for different use cases. Enabling collaborative knowledge and creation uh, knowledge creation among farmers and verticals, so we can uh, finally share our, our models and be able to expand them. And facilitating data and intelligence sharing and exploitation, and in the future unlocking finally unlocking new business models for everyone, for uh, the providers and the agriculture. Uh, the smart farms.
uh, I thank you for your attention. I think uh, um, this is the partners involved in our NEMO project, and I'm open for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonius. As, as before, we keep an eye on the chat uh, in case questions arrive. So we run them in parallel. And in the meantime, we go on with the IROS <clears throat> use case from uh, um, Anna, Anna Ria, uh, Riabocon from TT Control and TT Tech. Uh, if you can stop sharing the screen, Antonius, we leave uh, Anna the floor. I'm trying to find how to do that. I think Anna, you can just. Share I can your... see. I think I can. Yeah, overrule a little bit. So I hope that it was functioning. In... Can you see my slides? Can you hear me as well? Yes, we can. Good. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. So pleasure for us and honor introduce here today in the webinar IROS project and in particular use case we perform together with our partners. So I'm Anna Rabakon. I'm working for TT Tech Group and in particular in IROS we are included with TT Control and TT Tech Computer Technique, so two companies. And we cooperate in this project uh, with John Deere on the connected and cooperative machinery use case. And uh, this case is generic enough. It could be also applied, for instance, to constructing machine. But considering this webinar, we will give you some insights on uh, more farming side. And um, Alexander Wagner, colleague of mine from John Deere, will participate also in panel discussion. So. I will introduce shortly the project, similar as other speakers did. I will do give some details about the pilot and uh, two scenarios we are considering. And uh, I will give you some also analysis how we see the challenges considered in our use case can be solved with IROS solution or the solution co-created with the project partner in the IROS project. And we will list some impact and benefits we see already now, but we are currently in deployment phase of this solution. And uh, for sure, in a little bit more time, we can provide more details with uh, this regard. So IROS is about um, data and also efficient uh, compute and resource management. So it's uh, the system or solution which provides, uh, I would say, orchestrator on several la layers like micro edge, far edge, edge and cloud. So it's very much about the operating system, about virtualization approaches, about uh, pushing data between these layers to make uh, production or for us in farming domain to achieve um, more efficient producing of plants or yield we get from the use case outcome uh, su such that uh, the specific resources can be distributed within the system on several layers. So we consider, of course, uh, data which we get from sensors and we need to uh, perform data processing and uh, consider certain aspects like safety and security, for instance. And of course, uh, similar to other projects, I, I see already some kind of uh, synergies also with all projects presented today. So we consider deployment models and open standard. Uh, we need to deal with network management, but also, as I said, consider security and trust aspects. So sometimes you can imagine in the real life or real simulation as well, you need to perform certain operation closer to age uh, because you can't uh, spend uh, resources. Also, you can't wait for certain decisions if you, for instance, access data through the cloud. Um, this is the short summary of the use case we do. So in fact, or in short words, we try to optimize machine work to improve CO2 footprint. In first place, using electrical vehicles of John Deere, as you see here on the picture. And uh, we perform semi uh, real time data communication. You can imagine, for instance, this uh, the system should uh, deal with different tasks. It could be, for instance, monitoring task during the driving, which is more critical, for instance, if you have to consider some borders on the field or similar, 
or other less critical tasks, like for instance, grouping or some some different uh, aspects. So we are two partners in this use case, and on the slide you see also very rough simplified diagram of the hardware infrastructure we use. So we connect sensors, we connect some displays, we do use uh, Genesis receiver by John Deere for geo tasks and uh, modem also for data routing and communication but in the center of this picture you see also the uh, device or platform which is developed by tt control uh, which is uh, here in the use case uh, used for the high performance processing task so we deploy a state of the art uh, strong system on chips to be able to process all data or huge data we get from the sensors and all that is currently um, installed and also tested in the laboratory setup but we are also in this next step, uh, placing this on the prototypical vehicle of John Deere. So basically, the task is to perform um, large-scale agricultural uh, tasks and enable communication between machines, uh, collect data from different components, uh, but also to synchronize and optimize this work of producing. In one of the use cases, we do it without uh, AI supported algorithms but in the second use case we also deploy some AI supported methods to achieve certain optimization so and at the end we need to show also improvement uh, using real-time embedded analytics so, so how, how we contribute also to sustainability aspects uh, this is the slide with short summary about the two use cases we consider for both of them, the solution for TT control will be deployed and tested. Um, first scenario is about cooperative large scale producing. What does it mean? So we in first uh, step will integrate uh, the platform and algorithms which we develop and I will shortly mention them. Uh, for one vehicle, but also the intention here is to connect or to enable connectivity between several vehicles, so which will be tested here. So we need to perform a uh, field work in a platooning of electric vehicles. So the second use case scenario is focusing strongly on CO2 aspects to enable neutral CO2 operation, and here the focuses or goal is to reduce latency with real-time processing and reduce energy consumption. We have, uh, John Deere has some reference examples like buses to compare and with the, within the project we are trying to improve that. Um, this is the slide about uh, also very simplified slide about uh, IROS architecture, which you see in the middle shown in uh, beige and also green color. So uh, several services, basic services or some auxiliary services can be deployed on the platform. Uh, there is orchestrator or management system which should uh, in um, perform those services on the overall ecosystem. So in total in the project, there are five use cases, one like production or port use case. So we are focusing on John Deere and TT control exclusively on farming use case. On the top of this slide, you see the infrastructure components. So this is vehicle I mentioned and also high performance computing platform, but this is also uh, we deploy or use uh, on-premise um, center provided by John Deere and also with this cloud this is a presentation of operational center of John Deere so with certain data already historical data available in place for the comparison for instance within the use case on the bottom uh, I mentioned sensors we for instance enable driving can also autonomous operation we rely for instance on can boost interface uh, some who, who work more in automotive or off highway application know why it is needed so this is for to enable vehicle to operate in safe manner and execute communication tasks uh, but we need also to have a vehicle control interface and then red you see five application examples which are 
uh, used in the project for, for both use cases or for one of them, uh, which are partially developed in the project, but also adapted by the John Deere specifically for the needs of the project. For instance, this is machine analysis AI and engine or tillage adaptation or track, tracking and navigation application. Uh, this slide is the short summary for sure Aero solution, so which I said co-created uh, in the project uh, can provide uh, much stronger capabilities and much more services available for several applications. Uh, but for us, we see uh, benefit of this solution for three main things. So this is for distributed edge computing intelligence, for decentralized intelligent use in AI, and embedded analytics. So tractor should operate in a robust manner. So we can uh, we can uh, assume that there is no connectivity. So you can imagine that we should uh, take care of these aspects. And uh, so there are strong uh, challenges on communication part, but we still use also embedded analytics supported by operational center of John Deere for improved operation as well. Services should be orchestrated similar to other projects mentioned already, and we need to ensure balance of our resources between different layers. So this is all we do, of course, in presence of the huge amount of data available for the processing. And yes, um, as I said, we mentioned here only three, three benefits, but for sure there are much more which project provides for, to the community. Um, shortly about DT control, just a few words. You can read also my slides later. So we are expert on mobile machinery operation electronics for several domains like construction, agriculture, material handling, but also special vehicles like, for instance, snow groomers. And for all those uh, applications, we deliver either electronic control units or, for instance, human machine interface uh, displays. Etc. But we also support our customers for the application development if cloud services should be included. We have uh, several business units, uh, but IROS is only relevant for TT Control, which is joint venture of TT Tech and Hydeck International. John Deere, our partner in Kaiserslautern, uh, it's our opinion technology and innovation center in Germany. Uh, with about 250 employees there, uh, with a very strong cooperation with university and research institution and with the focus of intelligent system for precision farming and other technologies related for these tasks. Uh, worldwide, John Deere has more than uh, 82,000 of employees and uh, this is the shortly portfolio and images. I think this is a great examples to see, understand what this company is doing. So they are producers of agricultural equipment on contractual uh, construction equipment, but also on the tools, for instance, and uh, yeah, some other solutions. I don't want to take more time. Uh, I will post in chat the link to the website of IROS. Please have a look. We have a lot of also public deliverables which describe in detail use cases. And uh, as mentioned, Alexander and myself are available also today for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. So uh, just a recap on where we stand in our schedule. We have three use case presentation missing and then a short um, overview of the open course and then a discussion and we have 40 minutes left. So we are basically running a little bit late. It's it's fine because we uh, gave you know more time to questions in the chat and to use case presentations. But now I really need to ask a presenter's cooperation in sticking to the time. So for Andy, Leonardo and Roberto, try to not exceed the seven or even six if you can manage a minute okay so maybe then you also participate in the in the panel discussion and so you have time to elaborate better you know on, on something else uh, let's start with the andy so fluidos project andy you can share your screen and present the viticulture use case thank you no, 
So very quickly, I'm Andy Edmonds. I'm CTO of TerraView. We're providing the smart viticulture use case inside of Fluidos. Uh, I'm going to do things backwards. I like to do things backwards. So that's the company. The company has progressed itself up to now. and We're about uh, 20 people here in uh, Switzerland. And we've got 32 customers, all predominantly viticultural customers. But there are cases of uh, olives and such. If I jump on to my next slide. So just on the product itself, and the reason I bring up the product itself is because it's this product that we're actually bringing to the edge. And so people need to understand what the, var the various workloads are there that we could potentially consider. So here's the typical thing of, yes, we've got satellite, brilliant. Yes, we've got drones and drones indeed. If you look at the, uh, the payload of a drone survey, it's typically about hundred gigabytes. And currently today that's uploaded up over the network. We don't want that. And so we're going to pursue that in terms of uh, the framework that uh, Fluidos provides. Um, there's further integration of data. This is, tends to be binary or text type. The, the magnitude of that data is a little bit less. Um, however, we integrate with many other things, including robotic integration from a green culture and soon with a, a green uh, robotic. Um, we also then, of course, we have to manage what's happening on the ground. And so, for example, we have alerts and recommendations that are generated based on all the information we receive. And that's also further to elaborate and enhance upon by machine learning models that we have in execution. The, uh, what happens on the ground is very important. Naturally, we have ground workers there working. We have the application of chemicals and nutrients, et cetera. So these need to be tracked. Um, the actual the activities are not just any more human, but they're also robotic. And so therefore we have on the ground and also we have drone uh, automations included in the platform. And along with that soon to come along is the life cycle assessments, which allows us to understand the carbon impact upon the ground. One of the key things here for us is mobile applications, farmers, ground workers, they do not have laptops. They do not sit at a desk. They needed their, the information to hand. And so what they do is they can use our tools to run around the vineyards and understand what diseases or nutrition uh, problems that they have, and that's reported into the central dashboard. Very important is yield estimation, and also prediction. This allows for uh, farmers to understand what sort of capacities that they need when it comes to harvest time, and also understand what contractual obligations will be reached and potentially missed. If they understand that something is going to be missed, then they can make various uh, measures uh, to avoid this. Now, it's slightly to a side, but still on the whole aspect of impact on water, on agriculture, we have Aquaview. Aquaview was something that we designed, came up with. We understood the case that, yes, indeed, 70% of water is used for irrigation and agricultural purposes, but of that 70%, 90% is wasted. So we're tackling um, the UN SDGs uh, in order to arrive at a solution that's a sensor, sensor-less soil moisture and mapping analysis. There's a lot of advantages to it, but the key one here, apart from cost, and automation is a plus or minus 1.5% accuracy compared to the ground truth that's up high, uh, obtained, obtained from the hardware. That use case is actually, well, that a use, it is a use case also in two projects, Tidal and uh, Exa for Mind. Tidal is one on data spaces because we do generate quite an amount of data here. As I said, we want plenty of impact from the perspective of uh, certainly Aquaview. We launched this for free and we want to be able to minimize water wastage uh, in agriculture globally. So that's available right now for people to use. Um, all about the cloud continuum, uh, there's a lot of focus on computation. However, it's the data that really makes the difference here and makes uh, matters. And from our side, we've got plenty of data itself and it's exercised in quite a number of the projects and indeed in Fluidos, one of the places where we do this. So if we jump across now into Fluidos and the reason why we're all here today, um, from our perspective in Fluidos, we currently see that there's a silo-based computing continuum. Okay, It's very difficult at times to manage an application from the far edge, even the small device, all the way into the cloud. And so it's this particular challenge that we're uh, tackling inside of Fluidos. In Fluidos, um, what we have is another meta OS, and yes, there are plenty of them. 
And so we have to be very careful in dis distinguishing and delineating ourselves between everything else. But what we see is that from within Fluidos, we allow for the um, for to, to deal with multiple technical administrative domains and boundaries in order to provide transparent deployments, the communication and resource availability. And that's essentially a management plane um, and fabric that we have inside of Fluidos. So from a perspective of the smart fitted culture, Fluidos and Paraview, we, we've looked at it and we, we've seen that the current approach that would be there is that there's no simpler integrated fabric over the cloud continuum from our perspective. And there's no easy way to define um, in terms of, you know, um, KPIs, non-functional properties, except to manage that application. And they're, of course, very important, especially for our end users, is security, privacy, and trust. Trust is something that is born out of that, having that security and privacy. And so our ad expected advantages from uh, Fluidos in the case of our particular use case is to have further business continuity. So we talked about, indeed, you know, uh, lossy networks and such things like that. The network between the core and the actual edge isn't such a big problem. You, you need synchronization between them, and that's what we're investigating in this use case. From security, that's very important. So we, they're looking at trusted execution environments. And from decentralization, that a, has a, a two-phase approach as such. One from decentralizing, it means that there's less load on the central resources. So there's a knock-on effect and a positive one for ourselves in Terraview. And from the uh, end user side, there's more control, more privacy, and understanding that they can do the processing there. And so therefore avoid the large ingress charges. And in, indeed, um, the time to get the data up there to do the work. So from our side, this is the scenario. The scenario is a rather simple one, but it can be, and it's the scalable one. It's one that we can grow. Here, what we have here is the TerraView OS itself in the central cloud. And at the moment, we've got three um, um, vineyards, all of those having edge devices. What we want to be able to do and what we're investigating and what we're working upon now through the implementation of our use cases such that the edge users, so here we have three of them, they all have particular computation loads dedicated to them. However, some of them are, if you want to call them virtual. These are ones that are executed yet accessible uh, within the core cloud and that is made available by the Fluidos framework itself. Nonetheless, if you're a non-edge user, you can still use and access this, the facilities of an edge user. So in the case I'm an edge user C1, I can access that, access that information from anywhere. So we're doing stuff. So here you can see there's three devices. These are edge devices. All these edge devices have uh, Fluidos upon it. They have particular pieces uh, of uh, functionality of TerraView OS on it. The key piece here is actually for image processing. So we will run the image processing as the first um, workload out on the edge uh, to avoid that large um, ingestion of data. And here you'll also see that the user interface is running there locally as well. So that work continues. And where we're looking at it for the next, let's say, target platform will be the integration of the drones and the robotics. They being smaller uh, devices yet again that will be operating within the, the vineyard itself, but yet controlled by the local edge um, resource itself. That brings me to the end of my presentation and I hope it wasn't too long. Um, any questions, uh, you can grab me either at the panel or, or in chat. So thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Envy. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, now it's um, Leonardo's turn. So from uh, Nefele Project. Yes, I Hi. see you there. Hello. Perfect. Hi. Please share your screen so we can uh, start and uh, exactly. try not to. Um, I'll over try to be screen. short. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hello everybody, I'm Leonardo Militan from the University of uh, Zürich in Switzerland as a partner of Nefle project. Um, just one couple, a couple of words about the vision of Nefle. It's a MetaOS project that uh, tries to uh, build a, a system for a reliable and secure end-to-end -end orchestration of distributed applications over the continuum through, uh, from the cloud to the edge to the IoT and uh, to overcome all the barriers and integration interoperability barriers for IoT devices. So this project tries to cope with these issues 
with too many innovations, one is on the side of IoT to build a bio stack that enables the inter inter interoperability between IoT devices and the other side, the orchestration through the whole continuum. So we are involved in many aspects of the project as a university, but in one particular case, uh, use case, we are involved for um, for emergency and disaster recovery. Um, so it's nothing to do with agriculture, but it's more about crisis management. The partners are mainly two partners in RIA, which is a research center in France and, uh, and us. And what we want to build is uh, um, a system or a demonstration of the capability of NEFRA to support these uh, kind of use cases in and the specific of uh, a disaster scenario. We try to enhance the situation and awareness of first responders in this, for example, firefighters, and to collect the data so that they can prioritize their rescue or operations. What we need to do, what we in these use cases to deploy an infrastructure that is able to collect the data we need to to improve the situation of awareness of the of the of the first responders, and also enable some kind of detection of the risk and of the victims in the area to make mappings of the area and um, and provide assistance to the victims. So we have. An example scenario here, we have, this is a Luca Copper, it's another part, uh, part in the project, it's a Luca Copper uh, port, container port in Slovenia, where we um, are simulating, emulating, and then demonstrating our use case. We imagine that you we reach this area and there is no networking, there is, uh, you cannot rely on the on the mapping of the, of the port because some storm occurred or an earthquake, and there we need to take actions using some devices, which can range uh. from ground robots to drones or wi and wireless sensor networks. So we need to deploy this in an efficient way and then deploy the application that runs the whole use case through Netflix. Um, So we'll use ground robots to map the environment. We'll use wireless sensor networks to, to sense the environment. And then, of course, cameras and computer vision to uh, detect the situation and map uh, possible uh, risk uh, areas or detect victims in the environment. Um, there are there are some, of course, sorry, uh, a lot of challenges in this situation because there is an area that we don't know. There is a connectivity uh, probably is lost. Uh, there is a, a, a high number of heterogeneous IoT devices that they are on the area that produce their data. Uh, there are different quality of service requirements from the devices and and for the for the specific application domains. Um, and we need for probably the edge to have low delays in uh, computing uh, some heavy load uh, computations. And of course, the whole situation is dynamic. So with this, we'll have to change over time. So we have to, do, to deal also with this. Uh, the, idea, the idea is that we do some mapping, as I said, you know, different application domains, application scenarios. So mapping of the area, victim detections, risk prediction, device deployment of wireless sensor network. So the idea is that we use ground robots to deploy a wireless sensor network. And then we have also to monitor the whole the whole system. And all of this is supported by the Nefula ecosystem, which orchestrates the application, the hyperly distributed application and, and over the cloud, over the edge and the IoT devices, and using an abstraction as the uh, as the virtual object stack uh, proposes in the project. Um, so the added values from the project for, for our use case is that we have a reduction in the computational loads on the robots, which I have uh, not uh, a, 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 a huge amount of computational power, uh, so that we can do heavy load computation on the edge, for instance. We can generate collaborative solutions for mapping the, the area using drones and robots. Um, we can identify objects, victims in an area using AI models that can be run in the cloud or in the edge and not necessarily on the IoT devices. And by this, we will improve the situational environments for first responders uh, for mission control and optimization of the, of the tasks. Here you see briefly the consortium. It's a, for the Never pro project, and that's all. I hope I was fast enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for your presentation. It was clear and uh, efficient. So many mm -hmm. thanks for your flexibility. And now we have the final uh, use case presentation. 
before open calls and quick uh, discussion. So Roberto, Roberto Garcia Gonzalez from, uh, again, the Agri Data Space project. Um, okay, thank you. I will... Yeah, if you can, again, be efficient with time, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, I think you already see my screen. So basically, yes, I will can. try to be very, very fast. Basically, this is not actually a use case from aggregate space because there are not uh, use cases in, in aggregate space. It's more about setting the, the roadmap towards the uh, uh, agricultural data space at the European level. But basically, in this uh, slot, what we want to present is some experimentations that we have done that uh, are connected with our work in our data space, but also other projects where we are exploring, going beyond trying to implement some of these uh, views uh, from uh, data spaces. And we thought it might be useful because it's quite connected in many senses also with compute uh, uh, in the edge and all these, uh, these things that are being dealt in this, uh, in this session. So basically, what they wanted to highlight is one of the main motivations of data spaces is to, to lower the barriers for data sharing by increasing trust on the participants of the stakeholders. And one of the mechanisms used or proposed is that of data sovereignty that's basically to put uh, the owners of that data in control so they can uh, decide uh, what is done with their, their data and also get a fair compensation for, for the data. And, and this sovereignty is not at just the level of states or organizations, but we can even see that at the level of individuals. Uh, we think that this mechanism is very important uh, as a building block to later maybe monetize, tokenize uh, data sharing in order to build incentives. But it requires to some extent that uh, this uh, not losing control on the data is uh, a reality. No, that, that is that uh, actually true. And the parallels that we put here in order to better understand what we mean or, or what might be the, the, the extreme case uh, about control is that uh, what happens in, in digital music. Because anything that is digitalized is then very easy to copy and, and disseminate. So it's very difficult to remain on control on, on the data once you share it. In the context of music, we have seen that uh, there are alternatives uh, like the digital rights management that didn't work quite well because enforcing these uh, reuse policies, in this case of music, but also on data is very difficult, especially if you are outside a, a control environment. For music, the solution or pretty much yeah, what they came to is uh, streaming. It's a, a way of avoiding or making it more difficult to, to copy so it's still uh, possible. And we want to explore also uh, for uh, enabling this data sovereignty, let's say by design that the systems provide that control to the users, what alternatives they are. We have explored uh, um, um, solutions based on, on what are called the connectors in the context of data spaces. And they are basically peer-to-peer -peer connectors that enable the transmission of the data from one end to the other. But so there are some mechanisms and like policies at governing uh, what is done with the uh, with the data once it is sent to the other end of the of the connector. Uh, there is a very oh, a lot of difficulties of enforcing that uh, use of the data because once it is copied, then you lose track of what is being done, especially in, in environments that are not uh, with some level of trust at the beginning, uh, just like with DRM. So we're exploring the concept of uh, data rooms and compute to data. And basically it's a way that we're exploring to provide this uh, cell sovereign and data cell sovereignty by design in the sense that we have uh, all computation happening yeah, or the processing of the data in one room, you control who enters. In this case, it will be an algorithm uh, thinking about uh, compute to data. You also control what leaves uh, the room so using this idea of a uh, data room to guarantee that uh, you don't lose the control by uh, someone getting a copy of the data or, or a subset of it, just uh, aggregations that don't include 
personal data, for instance, or trained models uh, that guarantee that level of uh, uh, control of the original data, that you cannot replicate the data from, from the trained model. So we have been exploring that. There are some solutions in the context of uh, initiatives like GaiaX uh, to provide this kind of mechanisms. There are already implementations uh, doing that. We have been experimenting uh, with it, with this idea of keeping the control on, on the data. It combines compute to data. Also, we can uh, increase uh, the level of control with trust execution environments and also blockchain and self sovereign identity for all the other matters more related with uh, ownership, transparency, also monetization, tokenization, and so on. So we have a proof of concept as a small portal where we have some of these solutions uh, already running for a very specific, in this case, uh, use case, let's say. One of these is in the context of the AI for pork use case. Uh, we have an experimental pig farm uh, with different kinds of sensors. And the idea is that uh, we can use this approach, compute to data. In this case, it's at the level we are providing this service to, to this uh, farm. The idea is that we can, uh, as a more trusted party, guarantee that you can go uh, in reuse, train, uh, process the data, but without uh, leaving with copies of the data from this experimental farm. And one example that we have uh, implemented is uh, for images uh, of a pig pen. And the, the idea is that uh, the farm doesn't want these uh, images to be leaked or outside. So basically it's an algorithm that uh, you can send to this data room, combine it with the, the pictures of the animals in the, in the pen, and then compute some metrics uh, related with uh, well-being uh, assessment. And the algorithm just comes out with uh, these metrics and doesn't uh, leak any kind of image. And moreover, we have added monetization of uh, the data. You can pay for the data, for the algorithm, and also for the computation uh, time. So uh, we are also exploring other the topics like also doing these uh, in these uh, data rooms all the process of int uh, integration semantic in integration of the of the data and also pooling of this data so also guaranteeing uh, control and we are also experimenting uh, in moving these data rooms to uh, embedded uh, devices so we can see for instance you no know, uh, they added to machinery so we can send, uh, apart from the cloud solutions uh, by uh, the uh, manufacturer or whatever, we can also uh, explore options like uh, when there is a lack of trust or uh, you want to keep this control on the data that you can also use this embedded uh, data room to send algorithms, compute just uh, the, the, the metrics or the reports that you need and uh, leave uh, the original data on, on the on the device uh, without uh, leaking any, any information. And that's also another case that is more connected uh, with compute to edge. And that's all. I try to be really fast. I hope it <laughs> was fast enough. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. And thanks to all uh, the presentations. I agree with George's comments. Very nice use cases uh, with everyone. So. Uh, virtual applause to, to every one of you. And uh, now before moving um, to, the, um, uh, to the final, uh, let's say, discussion with some of you, let's hear some funding opportunities. So the open call from Nebulos and from uh, um, Fluidos. So let's start with Nebulos, Anna. Uh, in very, very short uh, minutes, please tell us more about Nebulos open call. Yes, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, fantastic. All right, just uh, quickly uh, passing by to let you know about this open call one that we just uh, launched last week on 14th of February. Um, the open call will be open until 17th of April and the main call objective is to validate the basic aspects of the platform by showcasing new use cases different from uh, the, the domains already tackled by the project and the team has established four different challenges that we invite you 
to apply for. You have uh, the first one focus on the workflow uh, application, a second one focus in the IoT application with variable, uh, variability, and the third on uh, serverless application. We leave uh, uh, a fourth open challenge for uh, anyone that can, um, if you don't find your, your, um, your project uh, in any of the other challenges, please submit via the open challenge. Uh, more to say, we have available for this first open call, 600K to fund four projects. Uh, it will be 100 up to 150K equity free funding for those four projects uh, to run seven uh, program for seven months. The eligible applicants are the industry, SME startups uh, working in the field, as well as research organizations when applying in a team of two organizations, knowing that the lead partner should be an SME. The applications are handled via the, the F6S platform. We invite you to have a look at the, the platform and also to read the guidelines and all the documents linked with the open call one in the website of Nebulous. Quickly mentioning that on the 5th of March, we will have a webinar to answer your questions, uh, all dedicated to the Open Code 1. Of course, we will have our pool of uh, experts. Mostly the technical partners will be able to address your particular questions. And also, I will be um, attending this webinar to clarify any administrative question you might have. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And now we have Costanza Pestarino for um, Fuldos. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, not in presentation yet. Voila. Okay. Can you see it better now? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I will try to be very quick uh, as my colleague before. So I'm going to talk briefly about Fluidus Open Codes. Um, briefly, uh, thanks to this project, this project offers three kinds of grants, the technological extension grants um, and the use case grants. The first kind of grants will be uh, open for individual applicants. This means um, uh, startups, as it means um, simply one entity. And these um, these grants, uh, these uh, these kind of grants, will be open for applicants who will receive up to uh, seventy five thousand euros in financial support in order to develop and integrate open source functionalities on Fluidus projects while the use case ones will be open both for individuals and for small consortia. This means uh, maximum three entities, among which one has to be an SME. Um, these kind of grants will be up 120,000 euro, euros in financial support. And the main uh, goal of these kind of grants is to validate Fluidus architecture and exploring new sectors. Um, the first Fluidus Open Core is open, uh, was launched in December and will be closed in, um, are indicated 19 of February, uh, which is today, uh, but it will be closed at the end of February. This is just to highlight that there are 10 days missing. Um, I inserted more slides, but this is the, the last I'm going to present because I think it's very important. Um, Thanks to this project and this, uh, this open course, there will be Fluidus Champions. Who is a Fluidus Champions? Well, when you're going to send, if interest, an application to uh, take part to uh, or win one of the chi grants, uh, there are Fluidus Champions, which are partners inside the project. They are more than happy to support you in your application, review your draft application, and give you constructive feedbacks prior to your submission. Uh, this is a tool that can help you uh, all the interest uh, applications, but since the uh, project is going to, since the first open call is going to conclude on the 29th of February, uh, in case, please uh, contact us to have a Fluidus Champions uh, to support you by the 22nd of February end of business. Uh, said this, just briefly, there will be uh, other slides in this deck that will be shared after. 
with additional information about the application process, evaluation process, and grant process. And sorry, and the links to have more information on the guidelines for applicants, the white paper on freedom architecture, and an email where you can write to us all the questions and queries you, you have. So again, I stop sharing. Um, but uh, yes, Fluidus open, the first Fluidus Open Core, a second one will be end in August, but the first one will end at the end of the month. So please go and check these opportunities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Costanza. And now um, let's uh, move to the end of the event. Uh, we have basically 10 minutes left, so we have to uh, rearrange a little bit, uh, let's say, the, the timing of, of this uh, panel. I hope uh, my panelists will, uh, will be flexible enough. Uh, so who will be um, commenting, uh, let's say, the event with me uh, in these last 10 minutes are uh, Leonardo Militano, who we already met uh, in the presentation of the use case uh, from Nefele. Then we have uh, Andy as well, uh, right? Should be uh, should be available. And then uh, we have two new speakers, uh, Konstantinos Railis from uh, Cinelixis and Alexander Wagner from Gindir connected to Iros. Uh, so Andy is back. Let me uh, maybe um, yeah put you more in uh, in a visible uh, in a visible way. So uh, what I would like to um, uh, to talk about now is basically um, take um, take uh, inspiration from the comments that we had in the chat and basically start asking you one question, two minutes each to reply. That's focused on uh, uh, sharing with us if you have any, um, let's say, um, lessons learned or best practices from your experience in both academia or industry, because you're representing different worlds, that could uh, be taken as an example for the successful implementation of Cloud Edge IoT technologies in agriculture, but also beyond. And especially in uh, your examples or best practices and lessons learned, if you have any considerations that go beyond the technical perspective, just to address the comments we read now in the chat, so related to inclusion, bro broader inclusion of stakeholders, multidisciplinary approach, uh, you know, and uh, a larger perspective that's not only technical, please also share this type of example so we address these topics a little bit. Okay, so maybe let's start with the Konstantinos and Alexander, who we didn't hear before. Uh, if you can let us know on your experience, uh, any lessons learned and best practices for use case implementations. So let's start with the Konstantinos. Uh, so, uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm... Constantin Israelis. I work as a software engineer at uh, Synelix Solutions, uh, which is a company that participates in the NEM project, as well as uh, the coordinator of uh, the Agri Data Value project, which is uh, pretty much uh, related to, in a, in a way, to Agri Data Space that was presented earlier in a manner. Uh, we have a precision agriculture solution uh, for farmers that. Uh, allows them to to monitor their conditions of uh, in their field uh, and to perform uh, and control actuations actuators for instance for irrigation or uh, for opening and closing a window in a greenhouse so uh, pretty much our uh, experience comes from uh, this uh, uh, respect uh, well uh, I really enjoyed the presentations uh, generally and the uh, use cases uh, what I would like to basically say is that uh, in uh, from our experience, both from uh, our product and uh, uh, within the Agri Data Value project, <clears throat> which includes uh, multiple, uh, more than 20 pilots uh, with actual, actual farmers, uh, let's say, uh, is that I believe um, uh, a good amount, uh, basically, <clears throat> 
there's a bit uh, of a skepticism from uh, the farmer side uh, to the generally to the adoption of uh, uh, te technologies. Not only uh, we're not talking only about uh, cloud native or uh, edge uh, computing. It's generally, uh, especially in Greece, uh, they're a bit uh, skeptic uh, about uh, the adoption. Uh, so what we have found out to maybe uh, be a bit effective is uh, to actually sit down with uh, the farmer, uh, discuss their uh, their actual needs. Uh, this is something that we do uh, in our experience uh, through Synalysis and also within within the project within the good data value. Uh, and we have found this to be uh, actually a bit uh, productive uh so uh yeah that uh, if if i if i had the suggestion to make is to really communicate with uh the farmers what uh, what they can get uh, uh really try to, to to form solutions that uh, uh they can understand uh and uh yeah i believe that uh, this will lead to it really try to communicate the benefits and this will lead actually to uh to wider adoption uh, of uh, smart farming solutions, uh, generally, I don't not only cloud native but uh, generally. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Konstantinos. I think that's very you know reasonable uh, advice. Um, Thank you. And uh, what about uh, anything that you can add, Alexander, to this? So hello, um, I'm. Um, Alexander, I'm working at John Deere here in the European Technology Innovation Center, and I'm part in the IRS project. And we at John Deere, you saw before in the presentation, uh, which were um, well. Thank you for all the presentations. And in our presentation, we um, showed that John Deere um, has a quite big portfolio of machines for agricultural business, but also construction and uh, forestry. And what we learn from the, our customers, where um, farmers especially, they are, as said before, they are skeptical about technology or the um, data-driven technology here or the yeah, um, adoption of new tech. And um, yeah, what we get um, for, as a feedback from them or from our um, as a solution for this was that we uh, had some, for example, first adopter farms where we can um, first uh, present these new technologies so we could show um, how they work, how they operate, and therefore they could also see some uh, benefits from this uh, technology and also got an idea uh, what are the improvements also from an economical side over not only one year or some years. So they uh, can plan better because farmers are normally have a uh, high pressure economic pressure to operate uh, very efficiently and if we can show them that there are improvements by these new technologies or the implementation from different cloud um, technologies edge technologies then they they are more open to adopt this um, yeah new technology Thanks, thanks, Alexander. Uh, in the meantime, for those who are you know, uh, still uh, connected, I'm copying the question that I've asked you also in the chat. Uh, I repeat it for Leonardo and Andy. So, uh, just as a conclusion of the event, <clears throat> what are the you know best practices that you can share in terms of application of use cases, not only technological but also broader considerations? We've heard from Constantinos and Alexander. The importance of involving uh, you know the farmers and the, and the end users um leonardo you're representing a university so any any considerations from from your perspective on this yes thank you i have mainly two one one is that from a university perspective we we love we love doing fancy things right doing research on the, the last technologies and trying out things that we never saw before and then we, we feel happy for that but companies have another perspective on this. Uh, they need uh, an impact on their on their business. So they usually are looking for a product that they can sell, or at least it can be useful. 
And these two worlds sometimes they, they come from different sides, but look at two two sides of the same coin. So it's just, we they both want to use technology, but they have different points of view. So there you have to find the point of contact, of course, and, and also an agreement on okay, research is fun, but but let's also do something real, some real product. This is one aspect I think is uh, is important in the collaboration between universities and companies. Uh, the other aspect is a bit. I share what uh, what Alexander Konstantinos mentioned. He's talking to the to the end users, especially. Um, in our use case, for instance, we are doing uh, we're doing a use case on emergency scenarios, and there we talked, for instance, to several firefighters brigades in the, over the Europe to see what they really need, and they say yes, technology is good. But um, but there is a bit of skepticism also for this uh, technology because, especially for uh, for emergency scenarios, it's also related to a bit of a risk, personal risk. So they really need to trust the technology in, to use it in their in their uh, operations. So there, you really need to sit down as as uh, somebody who said before me and and uh, and explain how the technology works and make build a bit of confidence in the technology itself. And on the other side, also really understand what the needs are. Uh, again, back to the research aspect, we, we would love, love to have the most fancy uh, research thing, but they have real problems that they want to solve. So we have to, to talk together and talk to the end users for this. Thank you, Leonardo. And then uh, Andy to conclude. OK. Oh, you, okay. Um, yeah, no, no, no. You know. I've got a couple of ideas. All right, wait now. Uh, so certainly, I absolutely agree with the idea of. Um, yeah, I I always get in trouble when I call them farmers. Okay, um, they they're landholders and they have many of them have significant resources and many all of them don't have a lot of time. I don't mean that as the death sentence or something. They've got forty attempts to get it right, and damn right they should be skeptical about anything that comes in. And somebody says, I'm going to fix it all by having all your storage on site. Um, that's a bit of a head scratcher for um, somebody who's concerned with growing the best produce possible. Um, and that is bound not by the speed of an electron or the speed of light in, the, in that case, but bound by the, the simple natural laws of mother nature. Um, so whereas we'll come in and we'll say, oh, you'll be able to do it really fast and da -da -da -da, and all of this type of thing. It, it, it's not really a concern so much for the um, for the landowner, for the property owner. And also if where it starts to matter is not with the landowner. It's actually when you move up uh, and not consider things from a business to consumer perspective, but you look at it from a business to business. And this is what we do in TerraView. We will, our, our typical customer will be um, an enterprise type user and they will then manage large amounts of property. I'll give one, for example, is uh, Treasury Wine Estates in Australia. They've got 12,000 hectares. They delegate and they work down upon these people um, and, and they need to be able to understand their, their assets, their investments and how they're actually um coming along especially with with, with uh, esg aspects and that's why we also have active view there the, the and the point there is is that these are the target uh, audiences for ourselves at the moment but be, and we're there with them because that's where we can make the, the most impact but certainly when, when it comes to those that own land education is needed simplification is needed uh, and and I, here's one thing that i always say the, the presentation of tools to help with regulation um, are, are super important. So we always, we, we've seen plenty of farmer protests uh, in recent times. And it, a lot of the time it, it's boiled down to unreasonable regulation being forced down from um, uh, yeah, authorities. Um, uh, and the farmer has no real um, handle on how to actually deal with that. A typical one might, might be nitrates. So how many farmers out there have nitrate sensors? Not many. So it's these type of things. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not the technology necessarily. It's not like 5G. I can tell you 5G is not really needed. 4G is perfectly acceptable, even 3G, especially if you've got a uh, synchronization uh, protocols there. And then, 
and and so that that's my my take so really what you tend not to see so much is the inclusion of social sciences and humanities in all of this and and they're needed in order to then further drive user research which is a counterpart to user experience and that's what's needed because we've we've received comments from uh there, there's one large agricultural association in portugal and we made the presentation this is third view os and you saw it there in the presentation um they say it's far too complicated <laughs> you, you scared them away um and so that's that's the the big challenge that i see um at least from the agricultural perspective um from the emergency services i, I can see a different thing but i can't see that technology is uh, one of those things that's helping that's my my, my bit on it all Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, everyone. Um, we are at the end of the event. I don't know if anyone from uh, the four speakers here or anyone else from you know the previous sections wants to add anything. Uh, if you want to say a final remark, feel free to do it now or write it in the chat. If not, we are already five, uh, almost 10 minutes over time. I apologize, but I think, you know, we went through a, a very rich uh, type of event. I just want to tell you, we have another, uh, many other events in uCloud Edge IoT domain uh, coming up soon. One in particular is focused on a different sector. Uh, if you have use cases in energy, uh, don't miss uh, next event we'll have in a week's time, 29th of February, and Diego will put the link in the chat if you want to follow the other event. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your time and have a nice afternoon and evening, everyone. Bye-bye. See you soon and everything will be online in the next days. Bye-bye. Thank you for today. Long.